everybody, Pastor Tom here. Glad you joined us once again for, again, another exciting adventure as we go back in time and study um, the tabernacle in the Old Testament. We're in the midst of our series on the seven wonders of the Old Testament. The tabernacle is amazing. It's filled with mystery. It's filled with revelation. It's filled with truth. And uh, I hope you are enjoying learning about it as much as I'm enjoying it. Um, before we go on any further, how about we just open up with a quick word of prayer? Amen. Dear Lord, thank you that we once again have the privilege to journey through your word, to journey with you, to draw closer with you, to learn more about you. Lord God, we ask that um, the Holy Spirit would be the great revealer of truth to us. So open our hearts, open our minds to understand what your word really means. Give us the revelation to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, for weeks now, we've been talking about this diagram that's over here, which is a crude drawing of the tabernacle which is, this is the tabernacle of Moses that he pitched in the wilderness uh, by the instruction of God. It's like the first church, the church in the wilderness. And it consisted of a five, uh, five um, cubit high wall made of a uh, tent around it. And on the inside, there was this tent over here that was covered that was split down the middle. Out here, you had the uh, outer court. In here, you had the holy place, and then you had the holy of holies and it was divided by the veil, or the thick curtain that we're talking about. On this side, in the Holy of Holies, was where the Ark of God was, was where the presence of God was. So we have been saying that this is a journey of how to get to God. Okay, this is a, a, a journey of Christianity. But it's also, as we said last week, it's the mystery of the revelation of Christ, and the ministry of Christ, because everything in here points to Jesus. Last week, we, went, we read some verses about how Christ is the revelation or the revealing of the mystery of everything that, that God has. Now, last week, we went over these two pieces of furniture out here. That this was the um, brazen altar where it serves as the type of the cross where Christ died, but it also, for us, it represents the place where we are born again, where we crucify our flesh, we crucify ourselves, we die to ourselves. So that's the starting point, the starting point of salvation is we die to ourselves. Then we said, we can't go from here to here because we're still filthy, we're still dirty. Because now we have blood on our hands and we have dirt on our feet. So God said, now you got to first stop at the laver. The laver, we said, is like a bird bath where um, it's filled with water and it's like uh, reflective material on the inside. When you look in it, you see the reflection of who you are through God's word. It changes the way you see yourself. So again, to get more of this, watch last week's teaching one, one more time. But this is where you are sanctified, you are cleansed, you are made holy at the labor. And it's the word of God that does that. Now, after the priests or after us, because we're priests, by the way. The Bible says that we're a, the church is a royal priesthood. After that, we go from here to here. Now we can go in. Now we're, we're saved, we're born again, we're washed, we're made brand new. But before we get to God, the very presence of God, in other words, we're not going to die yet, right? So before we get to the presence of God, we've got to learn to serve God. And this is the life we live on earth. We serve God. That's why I have the word serve written here. In the holy place is where we serve God. It's how we live our day-to-day -day life as believers. But we need to serve God in holiness. And the word holiness really means cleansed, purified, but separated from the world. The New Testament, it says, wherefore, come out from among them. Who's them? Them is the world. Sinners. Come out from among them and be separate. Be different. We're supposed to be different from the world. We're supposed to stand out from the world. Because the Bible says, we are light and they are in darkness. So the same way that light stands out from darkness, we're supposed to stand out from the world. So that's what it means to be holy. We have given up ourselves. We've died to ourselves here. We've been washed of our sinful nature here. And then we learn to serve God here. So we see three different pieces of furniture in here that show us really some of the key points of serving God, but they also point, of course, to the ministry of Christ. Okay? So let's talk about them. The first one I have, we'll go over this one over here. I'll do this in green is there was a piece of furniture right here. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence that this piece of furniture is face-to-face -face 
with the presence of God on the other side of that veil. It's the thing that is closest to the other side of the veil. And this is the altar of incense. And this is what brings us closest to God, face to face with God. Now, I, I think it is of interest and of note that when you study the dimensions of the three pieces of furniture that are here, that this one stands the highest. Okay, this one stands the highest. These two are both lower. This one stands the highest. I think that's significant. Because what does this represent? Well, this represents our prayers and our praise and our worship before God. That's what it represents. Now, just to give you an idea, every single day, the high priest would have to come into here. Okay, we, had an, we, we did have an opening here. And this opening was the same colors as the opening over here. If you remember, those colors are white, those colors are blue, those colors are purple, and those colors are red. So the exact same colors here and here, because they represent Jesus. Jesus are purity, the blue, that's white, blue heavenly, purple royalty, and red his blood, his sacrifice that he made for us. So again, we see the way um, into salvation is through Christ, this door right here, and also the way into serving God is also through Christ. But let's look at that piece of furniture. It's the highest piece of furniture because prayer is one of the highest things that we can do. Prayer is what connects us or takes us from the world of the flesh that we live in to the world of the spirit where God lives in. And God wants us to live with him. So let, let's take a second and explain that. Oftentimes, when we're in trouble, we want to reach up and grab God and pull God down into our situation. And that's understandable for a lot of people. But that's not God's plan. God sent Jesus down to grab us and pull us up to where he is. That's why the Bible says that we've been raised together, be seated together, where? In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, one way we live in those heavenly places, one way we walk in the spirit and get out of the fleshly realm is through prayer. So prayer is an avenue where we go from the flesh into the spirit where God is. Now, in the book of John, Jesus says, For God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Think about that for a second. Now, unfortunately, over the centuries, religion, and, and my definition of religion I heard many years ago was a man-made way to please God, or a man-made way to appease God. If you want to know how to serve God, God's word tells us how to serve him. Well, what, what has man done um, and, and said, this is how you serve God. You serve God by doing this, you serve God by doing this, you serve God by doing all these acts, all these deeds, all these works. No, no, no. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit. God's not really interested in a lot of the things that we do down here on, on earth, some of the religious things we do, because they're not really spirit at all. So how does man get into the spirit? Well, through prayer. And that's what the altar of incense is. That's what it represents. It's the highest piece of furniture, because I believe it's the highest service that we have is to pray before God. And that's why it's right before the presence of God on the other side. So twice a day, the high priest would have to go in, and he'd have to offer the incense on the altar of incense so that it was a sweet smell fill the place. Now, I said this a couple weeks ago, and I want to say it again because it's Still true. It was true two weeks ago. It's going to be true today. The nature of our flesh stinks. Our sinful fleshly nature stinks. So if we're going to be in the presence of God, you know, it, it's not pleasing to him. Our sinful nature is not pleasing to him. And even though we're saved, we still are in our flesh. Now, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when I used to work, uh, for Benjamin Moore in a laboratory, when I came home, I stunk. I worked in a lab with a lot of chemicals. And if I tried to walk into our apartment, my wife would say, whoa, stop right there. You are not coming in the house with those clothes on, dressed like that. So I basically had to get undressed in the hallway of our apartment and then go in and, and wash myself and, and, and clean myself 
because uh, the smell from the chemicals and stuff that I work with all day wasn't very good. In fact, uh, it, it could even be to the point where there were times where I'd be outside and my, I'd walk in my wife goes, oh, you smell like outside. And so that's a bad thing. But for her, it was a bad thing. She didn't like that smell. And smell is powerful. It elicits a powerful reaction that we have. So our flesh is stinky. Our flesh is sinful. And our flesh, remember, our flesh separates us from God because it's sinful in its nature. Well, how did the priest who was fleshly, the priest who was a sinner, how was he able to be, in essence, in the presence of God? Ah, he had to put a lot of perfume on to cover the stench of his flesh. Only this perfume that he put on was not perfume you bought in a store. It was a special mixture um, that... Uh, in, in King James, it says it was the apothecary, kind of where we get the word pharmacist today. It's the apothecary who would mix and make that special incense that when he came in here, he would immediately pour incense on the altar of incense, and it would fill up the room with a sweet and beautiful aroma. So I want you to think about this for a second. What would have been bad and stinky, for lack of a better term, our flesh, all of a sudden becomes a positive, wonderful, beautiful smell. And what made that difference? Prayers and praises unto God. So when we come before, that's why the Bible says we come before his presence with thanksgiving and praise. Well, why is that so important? Because it's the equivalent of, in the Old Testament, bringing incense and making that incense go in the air as a beautiful thing. Now we have a picture of that in the New Testament when Jesus was sitting down, the Bible says a woman comes in and she takes an alabaster box. Now an alabaster box, that was worth a lot of money. It was probably every penny she ever earned her, her whole life. It was retirement, expensive ointment in there. And she brought it before Jesus and she broke it and she anointed his feet. And what filled the air? A beautiful, beautiful incense and a beautiful smell filled the air. Now, she was crying at the feet of Jesus because she was a, she saw her sin, she knew she was a wretched sinner, and she knew somehow that I need to repent of my sin so I can come into your presence. And how did she do it? With incense. She filled the air with it. Now, we don't actually have to use incense because our incense, the Bible says, is praise. Our incenses are uh, our prayers before God. And we, we might go over a couple of those verses in just a moment. That's what it is. Now, our prayers and our praise, God says something very interesting about this particular incense that is made. He says, this incense that is made, it is to only be used here on the ark of God, upon the mercy seat of God. It is not to be used anywhere else. In fact, it's not even to be made for anybody else. It is special. It's sanctified. Now, again, the word sanctified means holy or set apart. In other words, it's just for this one thing, one uh, specific thing. And I'll give you an example where I actually came across that in, in real life. A couple years ago, my wife and I were down in Florida. We stayed, I think it was a married or a JW married hotel in Orlando. And while we were in the lobby, you know, day, day after day, a couple days, my wife kept commenting, because she has like a bionic nose, my wife, she picks up anything. And she was saying, the smell in here is so beautiful. I love it. Whatever they're using to scent this place, I love it. She goes, I wonder if we could buy it. So I go up to somebody who's working behind the counter, um, and I said, i got to ask you a question. My wife loves the smell that's in here. How do we get it? How do you get it in here, and how do we get it? How could I buy it? She goes, oh. You can't buy this. It's only for our hotel. It's a special perfume or special scent that's made exclusively for hotels, and it's pumped through our system, and it fills all the public areas over here. But you can't have it. It's made especially for us. And he said it very nice, of course. He wasn't uh, harsh or rude about it at all. And I was blown away by that. And the first thing I thought of when he said that is the incense that's made for over here. It's just for God. Our, there are certain praises that we have that should be just for God. Our prayers should be only, listen to me now, some of you, only towards 
God. We do not pray to other people. We don't pray to dead people, dead relatives. We don't pray to saints. We don't pray to other gods. We don't pray to any of them. The Bible calls that strange fire. And the Bible says, if you try to take these prayers and these praises and give them to anybody else but God, you're to be put out of the camp, ostracized forever. Because it is holy unto God. So our prayers go only to God. That's what that tells us right there. It's a special mixture, special blend of spices just for him, for his pleasure, and for his glory. That's what it is. So that's very important um, for us to understand. It can't be used for anything else. It can't be given to anybody else. It can't be shared with anything else. Now, another uh, interesting thing. Here's what the um, high priest would do, how he would get this. It was nothing more than just fine powdered incense, but something had to be done with it. The incense had to be added on top of hot coals. And once it hit the hot coals, it blew up and became far more intense, far more powerful, far more wonderful. The hot coals ignited or multiplied or magnified the power and the sense of those prayers. Other than that, if you, if, if you just put it there, it will kind of just sit there. So where did this high priest get these hot coals from? Guess where? Over here. So what the high priest would do is he would take his censer. What's a censer? A censer is most likely a pole of some kind, and it was probably it was made of gold because it was used in the holy place, and had probably a ball at the end of it where part of it opened up. He would then take that censer, and he would dip it in the coals of the brazen altar. He would bring it with him in here, and then he would take the incense, and he would pour that incense on the hot coals, then he would take the hot coals and the incense and pour it on the top of the altar of incense. And then once a year, he would do the same thing in here, on top of the Ark of the Covenant. But I want you to see the symbolism behind this. What caused those prayers and those praises to become glorious and acceptable and pleasing unto God? What caused them to be acceptable and pleasing unto God was the fact that they were poured upon the hot coals that came from the altar of sacrifice. That's an important point that we need to understand, because those represent prayers and praise. The altar of sacrifice is where we got saved, where we died to ourselves. So what causes, because let's be honest, a lot of people pray. A lot of people cry out to God. But God doesn't necessarily, he is, isn't necessarily moved by those prayers. Why? Because that incense just by itself really doesn't do a whole lot. That incense needs to be combined with the altar of sacrifice, the brazen of altar, where we get saved. So whose prayers really come up before the presence of God and the face of God? The prayers of those that have gotten saved, of those that are born again, of those that have died upon the altar. It's that combination. Now remember, the high priest couldn't get into here because the Bible says, God said that, um, God came down in the cloud and spoke with the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement, face to face. But he said, I will appear in the cloud. Well, what was the cloud? The cloud was the incense on top of the hot coals that were born from over here. So who does God dwell in the midst of? God dwells in the midst. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of, come on, his people. He doesn't inhabit the praises of, of anybody. He doesn't inhabit the prayers of anybody. He only inhabits the praises. Uh, uh, the word inhabited there is often translated, he's enthroned. In other words, our prayers and our praise builds a throne for God or creates a habitation for God to dwell in, which is exactly what happens on top of the mercy seat. He would take the coals from here. He would take the incense that was here. And he either poured on here or once a year poured on the mercy seat and would form a cloud of beautiful smelling perfume that God would then inhabit and he would be there. So that's what the altar of incense represents. The altar of incense represents 
um, the covering of our sin, the covering of our flesh, and also as a sweet-smelling savor to God, and it really only applies to those that have died upon the altar, because that's where the coals come from. Now let me give you another interesting story in the Bible. In the book of uh, Numbers, chapter 16, starting in verse 41, if you want to turn there and read it for yourself in the future, go right ahead. Surprise, surprise, the people of God once again sin. They're wandering in the wilderness now. That's where they are. Remember the 40 years in the wilderness? That's where we're at. And once again, they turned against Moses, and they're attacking Moses. They're, they're screaming at him. They want to kill him. They're screaming at Aaron. They're angry with God. It's horrible because it, we said in our message just past uh, a couple Sundays ago, actually, we said that it's in the wilderness where our true heart is revealed. Well, here are these people. If it didn't go their way, man, they got nasty and angry and jealous. They never learned how to submit or surrender to the authority that was over their lives. So once again, they're screaming, they're angry, they want to kill Moses and Aaron, and all of a sudden the Bible says the glory cloud shows up where? Here, in the tabernacle. And all the people go, whoa, we better step back because now we're afraid because God showed up. You know what God said? God said, Moses, get out of the way because I'm going to smite all these ungrateful people. And then Moses cries to Aaron, he says, Aaron, the plague has begun. The judgment has begun. The people were starting to die because of their sin. But Moses, because he's such a, a man of grace and a man of prayer, he barks an order to Aaron. He says, Aaron, get your censer, get some coals off the fire, and get some incense, put it on the coals, and begin to run out amongst the people. And so Aaron's doing this. And Aaron's no spring chicken, by the way. He's an older man at this point, just like Moses. So he's running with the incense, with the sweet smell of God. And guess what the Bible says happened? The plague stopped. And, Moses, and Aaron stood here with the censer of God. On one side in front of him were all the people that died, but behind him were the 95% of the people that were left alive. So what do we see? That incense... It stopped the judgment of God. That's how powerful it is. That's how powerful your prayers are. That's how powerful your praises are. And that's why I said that the altar of incense is a little bit higher than every other piece of furniture over there. And it symbolizes that our prayers and our praises going up before the presence of God. It's a powerful and it's a wonderful thing. Now, let's quickly talk about how this altar of incense points to Jesus. How this actually, in essence, is Jesus. Well, in John chapter 17, and remember, it represents prayer. John chapter 17. I'll get to it. Eventually. Here we go. Now, as I said before, this incense was to be a continual thing. In other words, twice a day he would go in so that the incense burned continually in there so that there was always or constantly the prayers of the saints were before the presence of God. Okay? So it was, it was to be a continual thing. Well, notice what the Bible says about Jesus. John 17, verse 9. Jesus said, I pray for them. I don't pray for the world, but for them which you have given me, for they are thine. Did you hear what he just said? Did you catch the power of what he just said there? Now, the Bible says that Jesus is our intercessor. He prays for us, which we'll go over those verses in just a second. But did you see what he just said? He said, I'm praying for them, my disciples. I'm not praying for everybody. I'm only praying for those that are mine. Or, I'm sorry, those that are thine, those that are yours, God. In other words, I'm only praying for those that are, have died upon the brazen altar who it's their hot coals of their salvation experience of their death are the ones where the incense goes on. They're the ones that are really your, yours. I'm praying for them. Not everybody, just them. Hmm, interesting. In Luke 23, Matthew, Mark, Luke 23. I'm sorry, 22. Going so fast. Luke 22, verse 31. 
And he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he would sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. Remember, this represents prayers continually going up before God. It represents Jesus as he prays for us. Hebrews chapter 7. Verse 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, or Jesus, saying, check this out, he lives forever to make intercession for them. Jesus lives to continually make intercession for us. Jesus is continually going before the presence of God to pray and intercede on our behalf. In other words, this is Jesus. He is that altar of incense that's continually before the presence of God, praying for us and covering. Think about this. He's creating a covering for our sin and a covering for our mistake. His, because his prayers are that sweet-smelling um, uh, incense that covers the smell of sin, the smell of flesh. So Jesus is continually praying for God for our benefit and to create a covering for our sinful nature and for our flesh, continually. And finally, in Romans, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, chapter 8, says this, verse 34. About Christ that died, that rose again, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. So it's basically saying, the Bible says that Jesus is the altar of incense who is continually making intercessions for us. Now, how it applies to us, Psalms 141.2, it says, David said, let my prayers be as incense unto you. It's our turn, it's our opportunity to pray for the people of this world, to pray for those that we've been witnessing to, to pray for our family members. And in Revelation 5, verse 8, it talks about that the prayers of the saints are incense, <clears throat> excuse me, before God. The prayers of the saints, our prayers in the heavenlies, are incense. And in Revelation 8, verses 3 and 4, he talks about those prayers are contained um, in a container that he's going to use in the last days. So our prayers become the incense that goes up before God. Now, let's go to the next piece of furniture. Right here is the lampstand, okay, which we would call the menorah, which I just made a horrible drawing of, a, of a horrible representation of. So in here is the lampstand. Now, right away we know that Jesus said, "For I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world." Then we also know that now Jesus is in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. And Jesus said to his church, his disciples, you are now the light of the world. So we see that that lampstand, that lampstand is a direct reference to Jesus as being the light of the world. And then our job as the final revelation that we are to be that lampstand. We are to be that light of the world. Now, again, every single time the high priest would come in here to light this candlestick, and it would be twice a day, he had to put first the incense on because his flesh was going in there. And his flesh needed to be covered with incense. So he put incense on. Then he would put oil in that lamp so that it would burn. Now, uh, the oil that they used in there was pure oil of pressed oil. Okay? It was pressed. And when I thought of that right away, I'm remembering Jesus right before he died upon the cross. We all know the story. Many of us know the story. The Bible says that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was there, the Bible says, that he sweat drops as though they were drops of blood. He was under press or pressure. And interestingly enough, the word Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane, means the oil press. So Jesus is actually the oil. He was being pressed uh, in that garden because it's his spirit, his life. He's the oil that's in the inside of us that lights our fire too. Okay, so I thought that was a, uh, a great understanding. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, uh, Jeremiah had a vision. 
And God said, what do you see? He said, I see a branch of an olive tree. And God said, it's good that you see that, because that's a sign I am ready to perform my word. Well, this menorah was made to look like, whether you realize or not, the branch of an olive tree. Okay, that's what it looked like. And it had cups on it and flowers on it. It was finely crafted. So this is a sign that God is ready to perform and to complete his word. That his word and his promises are yes and amen. The Bible says that God is faithful to continue in his word. That's what he's faithful and to continue to do, to perform his word. Of course, we also know that the uh, olive branch, we know that from a couple of weeks ago, the olive branch was a symbol of resurrection. It was a symbol of light, and it was a symbol of power, okay, the, the power of God to raise up. But also, there's also another very interesting aspect about the importance of this lampstand or this light over here. There was no other source of light to get in here, none. In other words, there were no windows that were cut in the roof or the side, none. It was a dark place. So what does that mean? It means that it's the inner light that lit up everything else that's on the inside of you. It's the light on the inside of you that lights up and reveals all the other truths of God. What do I mean by that? Well, if this wasn't lit, you would never see the altar of incense over here. It would remain in the darkness. It would remain in the shadows. We would have no understanding of what it means, of what it means, and, and the importance of our prayer, the importance of our praise. We wouldn't know that because it would be in the dark. It's the light that lights this up. Over here in just a second, we're going to get to the table of showbread. That would also be in the shadows or be in the dark. So this lamp, this light, reveals all the other glorious things that God has for us and how to serve him. So Jesus, who is ultimately that light, he reveals um, the other revelations of God in there. If not, if, if you take Jesus out of here, everything else of how to really serve him would be in the dark. Right? Because the light would be gone. Put the light in, oh, now I see I need to do this. Now I see I need to do this, and now I see what the importance is behind it. So we need that light. That light reveals everything else. So take that light away, and then uh, you are in the midst of darkness. Um, also, Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, it talks about that a rod from Jesse um, will be birthed, and he shall be a branch that grows. That's a prophetic word, speaking of Jesus, that he shall be that branch over here, okay? And uh, let's see, in John chapter 1, verse 4, 4 and 5 says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. As I said um, a couple, couple weeks ago, the almond branch represents two things. Life, because it was the first... Um, it was the first fruit on a tree to come. It would actually come in the win winter time and start to grow, whereas all the other trees were still dead, so it was the beginning of life, and also meant life. So that points to Jesus. Jesus said, the Bible says that Jesus is the light, and his light is the life of all of man mankind. So when the light of God comes on the inside of us, life comes on inside of us. Then finally, and again, there's many more things we can teach in this, but there were seven different candlesticks over here in the one menorah, seven different branches on it, which I believe, of course, represents um, God's fulfillment, God's fullness, God's completion, like the seven days of creation, okay? Actually, there were six days of creation, but, uh, but seven represents completion, fulfillment, and rest. Rest is very important. He said, come unto me, or the labor, heavy laden, I will give you rest. So the seven represents rest. God's going to complete his work, and then he's going to bring us to a place of rest. And I believe that's a message that's important in there to us, that we need to learn how to enter into the rest of God. But it also points to Jesus, who declared, I am your Sabbath. I am your rest. So the candlestick there points to God in many, many ways. It points to us in many, many ways. The last piece of furniture we're going to talk about is right over here, is the table of showbread. Right there. That was called showbread. This also means sometimes it references the, uh, the bread of his presence or the bread of his face because it's in the holy place before the face of God. 
Now, this represents several things that we, we obviously know about. It's a reminder that God continually provides all of our need. Because remember, uh, this was the manna. This symbolizes the manna that was uh, in the wilderness where God fed them. And so God would have them collect or make, the, in this case, he had to make, he gave them a special um, recipe how to make these things, and he put them in there. So this represents God's provision, but it also represents Jesus. What did Jesus say? He said, I am the bread from heaven. He said, I am the manna that came down from heaven. I am the bread of life. So the table of showbread represents Jesus, right? Because he's the bread of life. He's the bread that came down from heaven. But it also represents our provision that God provides all of our needs. The Bible says, my God shall provide all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We see that in the showbread over there. But also we have another interesting um, message, revelation of the showbread. Now they had 12 um, pieces of manna, 12, 12 round loaves of bread that had to go there. 12. They couldn't just be randomly thrown on the table. They had to be stacked, six on top of each other, six on top of each other. In other words, there was a special divine order to the placing of that showbread. Order is important to God. The Bible says, let everything be done decently and in order. And so God expects us to, to do things in order. Now let me give you uh, an interesting verse um, that many of us know over here. Romans 8.28. Actually, I'm still here. One of my favorite verses. Check out this promise, how awesome this promise is. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and were called according to his purpose. What a great promise. I don't have to worry in the future because I know that all things work together for good. Well, what does this have to do with showbread? Well, guess what? Here's another amazing word. The word purpose in here, you know what it translates to? Showbread. Isn't that amazing? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and who are set in order just like the showbread. So that changes the meaning of this over here. Changed the meaning of this big time. Because there's a lot of Christians who things don't work out for the good. <laughs> there's a lot of Christians who things keep falling apart and going wrong. They're like, why? Why do things keep going wrong? God said all things work together for good. No, 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 he did not. He said all things work together for good to them that are set in the order of the showbread, or that have their lives established and in the right order that God wants for your life. That's an amazing, powerful revelation over there. The fact that the word purpose there means showbread. If you want your life to, uh, to be provided for and to be blessed and all things work together for good, you better have your life stacked in order, the order that God ordained, the order that God described for you, so you were just like the showbread, right? So then, when your life is in the order that God ordained, then you could say, all things work together for good to them who love God. But if your life is out of order, well, Pastor, what do you mean my life is out of order? Well, if going to church is not a priority in your life, your life is out of order. Because the Bible says what? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the order that God established. But how many people, oh, I'm too busy doing this, I'm too busy working over here, I'm too busy having a part-time job over here, I'm too busy playing course with my kids over here. I'm too busy doing this. We're so busy, and we think, God, yeah, God's okay with it. God's okay with it. No, he's not. You're making a priority choice in life. For example, when you give God your, 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 your tithe, it's the first tenth. It's the best that you have. But we don't do that in church anymore. We give God leftovers and expect God to be okay with that. Yeah, I'll go to church as long as I don't have anything else going on. You know, when I, when I was younger in the Lord and I got involved in ministry, you know, my family uh, or my wife's family, they, they uh, would plan things on church service, and I had to say, no, I can't be there. But, but they're going to be upset. I'd say, well, let them be upset. And I had a conversation with my mother-in-law one time many years ago before she knew the Lord, and thank God she came to know the Lord, and she was upset that we couldn't be there because she planned a, a holiday party right at the exact same time that our service started in church. Why can't you be there? And I said to her, if I was a doctor, and I had to go uh, report to uh, the hospital for surgery, would you be upset? 
Well, no. I go, well, I'm a minister. Guess what? I'm called to go there and minister. And she looked at me because she never thought about it that way before. But you know what? She ended up getting saved, praise God, and, and amen. But I had to establish order in my life. So there's a, a prior, there's an order. What's another way we're out of order? Well, if I'm not as a husband and a father, if I'm not the godly man that God ordained me to be, I'm out of order. If I'm not a the wife and I'm in submission, biblical submission to my husband, I'm out of order. And if I'm out of order in these ways, I should not expect that God's going to make sure everything goes right for me because I'm not um, uh, set in the order like the showbread. If my kids are out of order, if my finances are out of order, you, you, you get the point? So order is important for God. That's why, again, God said, let everything be done perfectly and in order. So that's what the table of showbread represents. It represents provision. It represents that God has the best for us, that God will take care of us, but also represent, represents divine order. Now, lastly, this was a sweet, special bread, but it only got eaten by the priests. Only eaten by the priests once a week, they got to go in here, and they got to eat the showbread that was before the face of God. So only the people who took this walk all the way through got to partake of that showbread. And I wa God wants us all to partake of that showbread. But what do we have to do? We have to die upon the altar. We have to stop at the labor and cleanse ourselves. We have to see the revelation of who God is, everything God has for us through the light and the light of his word over here. We have to offer praises and worship unto God. And we have to understand God is our provider of our needs. He's the bread from heaven. And we have to get our lives in order so that we can then declare all things work together for good to them that love God. And their lives are established like the order of the show. Those are going to bring an end to, and you know, Somebody who really knows what we're talking about could probably go for another month, if not longer, on this. But I'm looking forward to our next study. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. God bless you. I'll see you live next Wednesday. We'll be back here going over our next um, ancient wonder, the seven wonders of the Old Testament. And so God bless you. See you in church soon. Bye-bye. Love you.